guys can be seated this morning. Good to see you. Good morning. So glad to be with you this morning for worship at Canyons Church. We have Tim and Sadie Thurman here this morning. Let's congratulate them on new, being newlyweds. Congratulations, guys, and has some family here visiting as well, so we're glad to have you. If you're a guest, thank you for being here this morning. We actually have a gift for you on the way out today, so be sure and see myself or Pastor Justin down front there. There is a guest card, a connect card. It's located in front of you. It's a little bit of a jog to the row in front of you these days, but we'd love to have you fill that out so we can have a record of your visit as we give you a gift later on. Well, as we open up this morning, uh, I want to turn our attention towards a passage of Scripture that has quite a bit to do with prayer. And as we think of prayer, a few weeks ago, we commissioned Rebecca Phillips as she moved to Oklahoma, and she was the leader of our prayer team here at Canyons Church. And I'm excited to announce that Janet Oshevsky is going to take over the leadership of our prayer team, and I'll be meeting with her on Tuesday, and we're looking forward to that ministry uh, continuing and to see what the Lord has in store. But in Hebrews 10, 19, it talks about us having... Uh, the ability to come before the throne of grace through Jesus Christ. And it goes on to talk about him as our great high priest. And then it says this, and you'll see it on the screen. Let us hold on to the confession of our hope without wavering. For he who promised is faithful. Say faithful. He's faithful. And let us be concerned about one another in order to promote love and good works, not staying away from our meetings as some habitually do, but encouraging each other, and all the more as you see the day drawing near. The day, the day of the Lord, the day of His coming. When is that? What what day will that be? Well, we don't know what day that will be, but I can guarantee you this, we're one day closer today than we were yesterday. And, And the Bible says here that in light of His coming, that we ought to meet together and encourage one another. And so I want to encourage you with this word today. When we come together to worship at Canyons Church, we're leaving behind the world. We're coming into this place, fixing our eyes on Jesus. And it ought to be a time where we exalt Christ, but where we also mutually encourage one another. How are you encouraging others today? How are you encouraging others Because when we come to this place, it really ought to be our recharge. And then the church that gathers is scattered back out into the world. But we have been encouraged as we go on. And even more so, as you see the day approaching. Let's go to the Lord this morning. Our Father, we have gathered in this place today in the mighty name of Jesus. We've gathered because you've called us to do so. And Lord, we've gathered to worship the wonderful, matchless name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, who alone is worthy of our praise. And so we sing to you, Jesus. Lord, we are not worthy. In fact, it's only by your grace that we are saved through faith. And Lord, for those who are in Christ today, we are victorious because of your mighty work for us on the cross of Calvary. And we give you praise for that. Thank you, Lord, that when we come together with the saints, with brothers and sisters in Christ, we not only have an opportunity to worship through singing and worship through praying and worship through uh, gathering around your word and hearing it preached and taught, and we have an opportunity to respond to it, but we also have an opportunity to encourage one another. I pray that today for every person who walks through the doors of this building where Canyons Church meets, that they would leave here encouraged. Encouraged to know that they're not alone in this world, but that Christ is with us and we are in it together. And so, Lord, I pray that in our service today, we would remember through every song that we sing that you are faithful, that you keep your promises, and that we have nothing to fear. Lord, I pray today for this service that you'd be glorified. I pray today uh, for each person who's here that you'd prepare our hearts. Lord, I I pray for um, Vivian, who a few moments ago I learned has uh, a sickness and and, and may have pneumonia. I lift her up to you right now, Lord. And Lord, I'd be remiss and stop right now and and also pray for our president, 
pray for his health and the First Lady and for countless others who are dealing with COVID and other sicknesses. Lord, you know the needs. But we pray today, especially as we're taught in your word to pray for our leaders. We pray for the president. We pray for uh, those who are around him who also have been infected with the coronavirus. Lord, we lift them up to you. We pray for healing. Lord, be glorified in this time. And all this we ask in the name that is above every name, the name of Jesus. Amen. Let's stand as we sing.
Amen. He is risen, and there is hope. Good morning. Welcome to worship. A father's infant son was on the verge of death. The father pleaded with God to save his son. The father lay down on the ground weeping. He wouldn't move. He refused to eat through the night into the next day. Those around him worried for him, especially when word came that the infant had died. Concerned that the father would be inconsolable, they discussed among themselves how they might tell him the news. But the father saw them whispering and just knew. And when he had confirmed the news that his son had died, the father got up from the ground, went to church to worship the Lord, and then ate some food. The people around him were so confused. How was it that the father had been taking it so well? How was it that his actions are so different now after the son has died? How is it that he grieved well? We want to grieve well. And I'm here to tell you, believers are able to grieve well. We're going to see it in our passage, 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, beginning in verse 13. If you're able to, please stand for the re reading of God's word. We do not want you to be uninformed, brothers and sisters, concerning those who are asleep, so that you will not grieve like the rest who have no hope. For if we believe that Jesus died and rose again, in the same way, through Jesus, God will bring with him those who have fallen asleep. For we say this to you by a word from the Lord, we who are still alive at the Lord's coming will certainly not precede those who have fallen asleep. For the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a shout, with the archangel's voice and with the trumpet of God, and the dead in Christ will rise first. Then we who are still alive, who are left, will be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And so we will always be with the Lord. Therefore, encourage one another with these words. This is the word of the Lord. You may be seated. In three moves, we're going to see how believers are able to grieve well. But before we get started, I just want to give you a little bit of a warning. Today, we're looking at a topic called eschatology. It's a big theological word basically means the study of last things. Last things include life after death, heaven and hell, as well as prophecy and the end times. Both of those are found in this passage. This passage also happens to be one of the more debated passages in Scripture, so lucky me. But whether you agree with how I interpret some of these things today, I'm absolutely certain we can agree on one thing and be totally united in it, and it's found at the end of verse 17. So we will always be with the Lord. May we never be divided on these issues with such a promise made to us. Looking at this passage, the very first thing I think, our first move, is hope in the Lord Jesus. You see, there is grief without hope. Paul talks about sleeping in this passage, and sleeping is a euphemism for death. And for many people in this world, there is no hope when someone they love or someone around them dies. In fact, many of us in this room, including myself, have experienced grief without hope. For me, it was a close relative and I was there in the hospital with her as she passed away. And I have no idea if she trusted Jesus. I have no idea, and it hurts. 
But a believer's grief should be different from an unbeliever's grief. And I'm here to tell you that as believers, we do not grieve without hope. You see, Jesus gives hope even in death, as we see at the beginning of verse 14. There is hope for life after death because Jesus died and then three days later, he what? He rose again. And all who believe in him, even if they die, will rise again, and we will be like him in the same way. So, we do not grieve without hope. We grieve with hope, because believers who have died are with the Lord. Believers who have died will return with the Lord. That's what the, ver the verse says here. To me, that means they're with him even now. As Paul says in another place, to be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. So many of us here have experienced grief with hope. For me, that was the death of my, cl my close friend. Her name is Bethany. Um, I worked with her about 10 years ago and uh, doing ministry at CEF. We spent a year working close together and she got married and went off to Alaska, had a little girl, and one morning she was picking up her daughter, and um, she had an embolism and died, dropped her daughter, and she was just gone. But guess what? That's grief with hope. I know where she is. I have a sure hope in the Lord Jesus. I know her confession and her trust was in the Lord. And so, we do not grieve without hope. We hope in the Lord Jesus. And our hope in the Lord Jesus is actually rooted in his promise to come back for us. Hope in the Lord Jesus who is coming back. He was coming again. That's our second move. See, there is grief with feelings of abandonment. During the time of the Thessalonians, there was uncertainty about the experience of the dead through the end times. Will they miss out on the action? Will they be unaware until the very end? There's even ambiguity, or it's unclear in current Jewish belief as well, even now. But Paul clears it up for us with a direct word from the Lord. Believers who have died, they're not going to miss out on a single thing. And so we don't grieve as if we've been abandoned because Jesus is surely coming again, verse 16. Now, there is some temptation in this passage to symbolize parts of it, to consider some of it is symbolic. But I just give a warning to do that because just as Jesus has truly really died and rose again, so too will he return. And Paul uses the fact in the history of Jesus' death and resurrection to support that he is coming again. Just as Jesus was resurrected, so too will believers be resurrected, beginning with those who have died already. And one last thing, the physical return of Christ is a core doctrine. All genuine believers and denominations and traditions hold to his return. Now, all the details, the timing, and what it will look like is subject to interpretation. But do not leave here doubting he is coming again. And so we do not grieve with a fear of abandonment. Jesus has not abandoned you, and neither have sleeping believers, those who have passed away. Because death is not the end. Resurrection is what we hope for, what we long for, and resurrection comes when Jesus comes. Even then, even as believers, it can feel like a dark night of the soul when we have lost someone. I remember running in the dark, feeling alone, hearing voices. No, I'm not crazy. I'll explain. I was running, and I was tired, and I wanted to stop, and I wanted to quit. 
I was running a physical fitness test in the army. <laughs> Alex. <laughs> and it was before sunrise, and I was tired and I wanted to stop, and I felt alone, and I, and I wanted to quit. But I could hear voices, and those voices were those people at the end, the finish line, calling out encouragement, telling me I was almost done and to keep going. As believers, we run with a purpose, we run with an encouragement. We are not being abandoned. We will not be abandoned because Jesus is coming again. Jesus is not only coming back for us, he is also coming to take us home. Move three. Hope in the Lord Jesus, who is coming again to take us home. You see, there are those who grieve with nowhere to go. Jehovah's Witnesses believe that when you die, you experience something called soul sleep. There are even some Christians that believe that, that when you die, you are unaware until the very, very end. They may take the euphemism of sleeping a little too literally. As I mentioned, Jewish thought on life after death was hotly debated then, and it's even unclear now. But, as we've seen in this passage, it tells us the believers who have died are with the Lord, and they will come with Him, and they will be resurrected first. So, we do not grieve as those with nowhere to go. In verse 17, we see that living believers at the time of Jesus coming back will be caught up and transformed. So after the dead are raised and resurrected, there those who are living will be caught up. Now, caught up includes the idea of being suddenly seized or snatched. It's often associated with uh, being transformed in the twinkling of an eye, if that sounds familiar, or in that it will happen like a thief in the night. You know, this verse right here is a primary verse to describe and defend an event called the rapture. And that word rapture comes from the Latin word, which means to be snatched up or seized. There will be a meeting in the clouds. As the bride, living believers, we will go with the groom to the wedding feast. And I believe the wedding feast is in heaven. I don't think we'll be snatched up in the air in order to do a U-turn and come straight back to earth. You may disagree, and that's okay. No, I think Jesus is coming to take his church home. There are some verses that I think kind of support that idea. Revelation 12 is a very interesting passage. Most don't think of it in terms of rapture, but I do. Verse 5 says, she gave birth to a male child, one who is to rule all the nations with a rod of iron, but her child was caught up to God and to his throne. It's interesting, John writing this, he's actually quoting Isaiah. And in Isaiah, it says she gave birth to a son who is to rule. John chose to add a word in his quotation. That's why you see male child there. I think that male child is referring to Jesus and his church and that we will be caught up to God and to his throne. Another verse, John 14, Jesus tells us that he is going to depart to prepare a place for us. You see, Jesus is building our home. And when he comes again, he's going to take us to his father's house. I think those who are raptured will be preserved in heaven to await Christ's physical second coming where he sets his foot upon the earth again as the conquering king of kings and lord of lords after a time of great tribulation has occurred. Here's the thing. Believers never leave his side. I also think Jesus is coming to take us home not to leave us to the wrath to come. You see, the passage today, the very end says, therefore encourage one another. This is an encouraging passage. And Paul, I think, assures us that Jesus will deliver us 
from the wrath to come. And that is looking at 1 Thessalonians as a whole. We have 1 Thessalonians chapter 1, verse 10, that tells us that Jesus delivers us from the wrath to come. Next week, sorry Jason, stepping on your toes a little bit. Next week we see that we're not destined for wrath. And then in Revelation 3.10, we see Jesus will keep us from the trials to come. Again, you may disagree with me. That's my position. Please come talk to me. Um, we can hash it out. But to me, the point is, believers grieve with home in our mind's eye. Jesus is preparing our home even now. And our church members who have died, even just recently, who have fallen asleep, guess what? They are with Jesus right now. And they'll be the first ones to know resurrection. You see, we do not grieve with nowhere to go. We grieve with our eyes fixed on our home with the Lord. We do not grieve as those with no hope. We do not grieve as if we have been abandoned. And we do not grieve with nowhere to go. We grieve well because we hope in the Lord Jesus who is coming again to take us home. When we began, I told the story of the father and his dying infant son. Did any of you recognize that story? That was King David in 2 Samuel. You see, even David's servants were confused by his response to the news that his son had died. They were sure David would be inconsolable. Instead, we saw the grief of someone who has hope. I want you to listen to David's own, word, own, own words when his servants asked him about his response to the news. He answered, while the baby was alive, I fasted and wept because I thought, who knows, the Lord may be gracious to me and let him live. But now that he is dead, why should I fast? Can I bring him back again? I'll go to him, but he will never return to me. I'll go to him. David is one of two Old Testament authors that has any concept of resurrection. I really think David knew he had a hope that he would see his son again. I hold to that same hope. May we grieve as David grieved, with hope, with the promise, with our home fixed firmly in our mind's eye. When you're grieving over the passing of a believer, be encouraged by these words. And when you are with someone who is grieving, encourage them with these words. And if you're sitting here today, and you do not know the hope of which I speak, do not leave this place without coming forward during time of invitation and speaking with me or with Pastor Jason about this hope. Do not leave here without allowing us to share this hope with you. During this time of invitation, please come forward and know the hope that only Jesus can provide. Let's pray together. Lord, you are so good to give us such a sure hope that we can see the resurrection of your Son and know that you have promised to resurrect us as well. Father, I pray for those here who have lost people. I pray that you would Assure them that we have lost nothing, that they are with you and preserved. Father, I pray that you would encourage them and comfort them. For those here who know grief without hope, those who were not sure are with you. I pray for only the comfort you can provide. 
And Father, I pray for those who may not know this hope at all, that you would prompt them by your Spirit right now, that you would drive them to the altar and allow us to share hope with them, Father. Please, I'm asking you in Jesus' name, don't let them leave without asking. Father, be with us as we consider these things. Encourage us with these precious promises. In Jesus' name, amen.
Maybe you thought, well, that was a short sermon, and now we can go eat, but no. <laughs> Instead, I would like to introduce a very, very special person. Her name is Patty Lappin. She is the teacher trainer for CEF of Utah. She will be leading the training that we are having this Saturday that all of you are invited to attend. And I've invited Patty to come up and share a little bit about CEF and about what you can expect at that training. Please welcome Patty. Stand right here. Good morning, everybody. It's so great to be with you, to worship with you. Um, you know, God is an amazing God, and he loves everyone around us. And one of the cool things about what has happened that I am seeing um, in this crazy time of face masks and, you know, I, this whole elbow thing, oh my goodness. <laughs> I'm a very huggy person, so it's hard for me. But, um, but I am noticing that we are uh, talking more to our neighbors. And um, one of the things that God desires of us is once you know Christ is your Savior, he wants you to tell others about him. And it is a joy to tell others about him. You know, it's, it's not just our pastor's responsibility. It's all of our responsibility. And, um, and so um, we, we want to give you a little bit of opportunity to be able to learn and be more secure in that. Um, I'm a full-time missionary with Child Evangelism Fellowship. Uh, we are in every country but North Korea. And um, so uh, we get special opportunity to just be everywhere and tell people about Jesus. And so we're going to have a special time where we're going to get together and we're going to learn something called a wordless book. A wordless book is just a, uh, five colors that share the gospel. And it makes it easy for you and I to do that very thing. We use it oftentimes with children. But it wasn't created, actually, to be something with children. It was created to be uh, something just to, to share God's word with other people. And, um, and so um, our goal in Child Evangelism Fellowship is to be a partner with you, to just assist you in the job that God has given you to share Christ with your neighbors, with your friends, with everyone um, that you come in contact with. And, and we had the chance of working together several times in different cities and sharing Christ and um, so we're just excited. I, I think we're excited to work together again. <laughs> and um, we just hope that, that you will join us Saturday at 9 o'clock. We're going to get together and have some fun reviewing the gospel. Um, you know, pouring out our heart to God, asking him, you know, show us who we can share Christ with. And that's, it'll, be, it'll be a lot of fun, but, but a really wonderful thing to help you to share Christ with the people around you. And then you also, as a church, are um, on the 31st going to have an event here, I believe outside in the parking lot. And um, so inviting people to come in and have some fun, but, um, but also have a chance to share the gospel with those people that come. And, um, and so um, I just I hope that I'll see each one of you here on Saturday and we'll have a chance to uh, just spend some time learning more about the gospel and how to share it simply with other people. I'm going to pray for Patty real quick. Father, we thank you so much for Patty and her passion. Father, thank you for using her. We pray for her that you would continue to provide for her and the ministry you've set her to. Father, um, thank you so much for her. Continue to bless her. And as I said, provide in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Patty. Thank you. I do believe that rocket ship wants to blast off. Hey, Elizabeth, will you um, go to the at, the, at the end, there should be some announcement slides there that we added between services. 
you'll go there for me in just a second. And what we have learned this morning is that actually Justin is the short preacher, not me. That's what we have learned this morning, if nothing else. Amen? Amen. All right. Well, let me just have an uh, opportunity to give you a couple announcements really fast. Uh, we do have a business meeting after church next Sunday. It's going to be the quickest business meeting in the history of Canyons Church. It is a called business meeting. There's one item on the agenda, which is to receive a recommendation from the nominating team to fill two vacant spots on the benevolence team. So we're going to receive a recommendation. We're going to vote. We're going to go eat fried chicken. Any questions? Okay. All right. And then um, also we've heard about the training on Saturday. That's this coming Saturday from 9 to 12. Sunday school teachers, parents, uh, children's ministry volunteers, anybody. Uh, those are the ones encouraged, but anybody uh, can come and join in with that training. And then um, on Sunday, October 11th, that's the very next day, uh, our plan right now is for those children who are pre-K through third grade whose parents would like for them to go to children's church. We'll exit out right before the sermon. We'll release those kids, and they'll go downstairs. They're going to be in two separate rooms, elementary and pre-K, uh, and they're going to be distanced and having masks, and so that'll be taking place next Sunday right before the sermon. And then on Wednesday, October 14th, our family worship returns at 6.30 p.m. And the student ministry is also, you can go on to that goodbye slide back there, uh, Elizabeth. Yeah. Are they rotating? Okay. This is what happens when Pastor Jason loads the announcements, okay? <laughs> this is what happens when I do it. But anyway... Um, just so you know, the family worship will return, and that's also when student ministry will shift uh, into meeting in person as well on Wednesday, October 14th. And then, um, just as a reminder, our Fall Family Festival is coming up on October 31st. It's going to be completely outside this year. We're expecting more people to come than normal given the circumstances, so we're going to have to be uh, having our act together as far as procedures and how we go about doing the Fall Family Festival. But right now, uh, we would invite you to go ahead and be bringing in candy because that's something we can do right now to get ready for that event. Have you been glad to be in the house of the Lord this morning? All right. Well, I invite you to stand this morning as we prepare to be dismissed. Um, Mark, come on up. Our, our deacons had a training last Friday night Deacon's ministry is sort of relaunching into this new year, and um, they're, they're truly partners. We're partners together, the pastor and the deacons, and they're helping me so much, and um, they're going to be involved in deacon family ministry, so go ahead and be expecting that you'll get a phone call from a deacon, and they'll just want to know, how can we pray for you, how are you doing, you know, those kinds of things, and they'll be checking in once a month just to see how you are. And that's how I am, as one person, able to keep up with the flock as a whole. And then the other thing is we have a deacon who will be on call each week. And so starting today, Mark Burgess is our first on-call deacon. And he's agreed to come up and close our service in prayer this morning. Thank you, Mark. Okay. Okay. Live? Yep. Okay, join me in prayer, please. Um, dear Lord, as we uh, come to close out this time of fellowship and worship, um, and learning of your word today, we we ask that you would be with um, each and every person here. Lord, uh, I know that everybody here probably has prayer requests and, and prayer needs. Uh, Lord, help us all to uh, be reminded that you know each and every one of those sometimes before we even um, utter the words. Um, so, Lord, I pray that you would hear and... and uh, and help provide for and encourage and, and answer the prayers of everybody here, whatever they might be. Um, Lord, thank you for the privilege of being here, for our pastors who minister to us and pray for us and love us. And uh, Lord, for the worship team, pray for everybody that supports our church to uh, make all this possible. Pray, Lord, that you'd guide our church, guide us as individuals and give us wisdom. And, uh, and, and Lord, we just pray these things and, and ask these things in the precious name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen.